It's July 1st, and you know what that means. It's time for Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And it's me, Daniel Helen, and welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah, we are so happy to spend time with you again here. We've got two new cases to look into. Pretty interesting stuff. But of course, before we get to that, we have to talk about voting results with Danielle for last episode, which was criminal cops. What happened, yeah. Danielle? Man, that was, first of all, a very interesting episode. I've been looking into a lot more information ever since then, but I was interested to see how it would go in the voting results, and I'm honestly not too surprised. On Twitter, I had 44% of the votes, and John had 55%. Woo! And that just continued right on over to YouTube as well. YouTube, I had 40% of the votes, and John had 59%, and that means season two total so far, Four for Danielle and five for John. Whoa. Wow. Well, you know, Danielle, we're, we're getting pretty close to the end. We've only got two more votes, I think. If I I'm... was just, yeah, I was just thinking about this last night. I, I kid you not, I was sitting in my bed and I sat straight up and I was like, wait a minute. I filmed the podcast tomorrow and <laughs> it's summertime, which reminds me of when we started like planning the podcast. And then that means that we're running out of time. And I had like a whole panic. I just, I just panicked for a minute in my head. <laughs> yeah. And because of that episode that we had with Stephanie Harlow, uh, we're yeah. not going to tie. There there will be a winner this year. So is Danielle going to continue her run or will the season of revenge come to fruition? <laughs> I There's have no, no idea. telling. Yeah. I we, guess I'll have to give you the cup, though. <laughs> I guess you do. Where is that cup? I haven't Rightfully. seen it in a while. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, it's coming with music this time. I love it. <laughs> it does. Here you go. You can take All it right. back. I will be coming back for it, though, just to let you know. Thank you so much. I will keep it over here. And I might even put some G2 in it for the rest of today's episode so that I can there kind of go. throw a little jab at you every now and then when I raise the cup to take a drink out of it. Um, I'll just close my eyes every time. Uh-oh. <laughs> pretend, pretend like I don't see it. <laughs> well, I'll be sure to do it when you're uh, telling your side of the story then so you can't see what your, your script. Um, all right. Well, today we are looking for cases solved by psychic. Will we find any? or at least one is this episode going to be a total bust <laughs> well there are shows that highlight cases like the ones that we were looking for and there's a particular show called psychic investigators and guess what you can find it at the place that is today's sponsor and that's magellan tv Magellan TV is a streaming service founded by filmmakers with a passion for producing and curating the best content out there. History, science, space, nature, and of course, true crime. It's all waiting for you on Magellan TV. They also have some amazing shows like Psychic Investigators. Yeah, and I, I have to say that I really appreciate the approach because they do a very fair portrayal of the cases. They kind of, they take you along from the psychics investigation, but they also have the investigators, the police investigators and their point of view as well. It's not what I consider a believer show. It's really fair. Yeah. It doesn't try to convince you really one way or the other. It just brings you along for the ride and lets you decide for yourself. Magellan TV works on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, iOS. You can watch it on your TV, laptop, or mobile device anytime, anywhere. With more than 2,000 documentaries, and yes, you heard me right, and new content being added weekly, including 4K content at no additional cost, why wouldn't you give Magellan TV a shot? Crime After Crime viewers can try it out for free. Visit try.magellantv.com forward slash crime after crime, and you'll get a one month free trial. There's nothing to lose. Get Magellan TV, give Magellan TV a try for free, and thank them for supporting Crime After Crime at the exact same time. Visit try.magellantv.com forward slash crime after crime today. Now, you know, Danielle, I did consider just watching Psychic Investigators and picking out a case from there, but uh, I kind of felt like that'd be cheating for today's episode. I wouldn't be lying if I said I may have almost done the same <laughs> exact thing because I was like, you know, I don't, I don't know. I was like, I feel like I've looked into this before and I never found anything too interesting. So yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> we're going to see what happens. So what is the official word on psychics from a law enforcement perspective? Well, I found a really interesting release at the CIA 
titled Use of Psychics in Law Enforcement. Now, while it was released publicly in August of 2000, I'm pretty sure that it's from the late 70s or early 80s. I mean, it looks like it came right from an antique typewriter or from the (laughs) prop department for the X-Files. In essence, it's a paper trying to create some guidelines for law enforcement's use of a psychic. They reached out to 11 police departments they heard had used psychics successfully. Eight officers responded that the psychic gave them previously unknown information, and in three of those eight cases, bodies were found in areas described by the psychic. Two officers said they got new information, but it was too general to be helpful. Now, one officer said he had little success and would never use a psychic again. Again. (laughs) Again. Never again. (laughs) But, Danielle, keep in mind that they reached out to 11 departments that specifically had good experiences with psychics. So, I honestly don't know how this guy got in there. (laughs) They all had great experiences, every single one, except except for that one. (laughs) Yeah. I'm never going to use them again. Um, Ultimately, this paper released by the CIA thinks that there may be some benefit and it attempted to establish some expectations and guidelines like... Try to be objective, which I'm really trying so hard this month, Danielle. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to be objective. (laughs) Uh, Tape record whatever the psychic says. Don't ask them to stop or repeat themselves because they may, quote, lose their thoughts. I mean, you never know. It might happen. It also cautions that most often the information will be general in nature and may require interpretation. Like if the psychic sees a windmill, that might mean the body is located near the windmill estates. If they say two guys are important, it might mean the two guys department store was associated with the case. The paper is also clear that courts don't recognize psychic testimony and cautions that even talented psychics cannot be 100% correct all the time. That's a good point. Neither can I. Um, I was about to say neither. Yeah. Only uh, some of the time. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Another very big point that they make on this paper is that none of the psychics in these 11 cases charged for their service. They only asked for meals and lodging if they had traveled to a scene. In 2015, UK's College of Policing released a draft of their documentation on using psychics for missing persons cases, and they also made a bit of a similar point. Here's a quote from it. These contacts usually come from well-intentioned people, but the motive of the individual should always be ascertained, especially where financial gain is included. Uh Crime After Crime listeners, please keep that in mind for when we get to my story in particular. But now it's time to hear Danielle's. It must have been easy for you to find a story, right, Danielle? Oh, yeah. I I had a dream about it and I was just led straight to it. There you go. That's how it works. That's why you have to keep a notepad by your bed so you can write down your psychic visions. Exactly. This was actually very difficult. And I had mentioned with you guys, I think last episode, that I had one that came off the top of my head and... It's, this is just a prime example of how these cases seem to go. You think you know what happened, and then it just didn't go the way you thought. Mm. But this one, honestly, the one I, that I found, it does make me question some things. And so I'm very interested to see how the conversation with you is going to go when I'm done, John. Okay. All right. I'm in for it. <laughs> On December 15th, 1980, a man named Paul Woods called into Los Angeles Police Department to report a carjacking. It was around 10.45 p.m., and it was in the Pacoima District, which at the time was known for a pretty large rise in crimes, particularly homicides. Um, And Paul claimed that a black pickup truck had stopped at a traffic light on Foothill Boulevard. While he was waiting there, or the truck was waiting there for the light to change, two men ended up approaching the vehicle from either side, and they forced their way into the car. And Paul remembered hearing a woman screaming from inside of the vehicle, and the car drove off with the women, woman and the two men inside. So at this point, when this call was put in, authorities weren't sure who the car belonged to. No one had reported a stolen vehicle that matched that description. There was no one that was a missing person that was, you know, driving a car like that. And obviously this had just happened. So they had not anything to go on. It was just a waiting game. But fortunately, they didn't have to wait too long. Only six hours later at around 5 a.m., another call came in to authorities. There was a car matching the same description engulfed in flames on Bromont Avenue. And this avenue, when I looked online, it wasn't like in the middle of 
just like a busy street. It was actually a residential neighborhood. So this was, first of all, very strange in itself. Plus, usually if you find a car that's engulfed in flames, the owner's calling it in because there's been some sort of malfunction or... But this was completely right. different. And yeah. they believed that possibly the car had been stolen or involved in some type of crime. So authorities were alerted. However, when authorities first looked into it, again, they could not link this to anything, which I found very interesting because it matches the description of a car that was seen earlier, just six hours earlier, but they couldn't link it. That's neither here nor there, but I found that interesting. Hmm. But again, just hours later, a woman walked into the local police station hysterical, and this woman's name was Shirley Trussell, and she wanted to report that her friend, Melanie Uribe, was missing. She said that Melanie had left for work the night before, as she typically did, but she never made it in and nobody had heard from her since. This was especially concerning because she was the single mother of an eight-year-old boy. It was entirely out of character for her to go missing. Shirley had decided in that time frame before going to authorities to gather a few friends together that were also concerned about Melanie, and they went out to the Pacoima area that they knew she would have had to drive through in order to get to Pacoima Hospital where she worked as a nurse. They'd apparently spent the entire day searching for her, and then at around 3.30 p.m., they just so happened to go right past the black burned truck on Bromont Avenue, and the car had still not been moved yet, and the friend immediately recognized the car as belonging to Melanie. Mm. Shirley began to describe Melanie to Patrick Conmay, who was the officer she was speaking to in hopes that he would understand, you know, this is an emergency, you have to look for her. She told him again, Melanie's a 31-year-old single mother to an eight-year-old. She was very responsible, very dependable. She was a great nurse, a great mother, and Shirley didn't believe for a minute that Melanie had run off on her own. And given the circumstances the vehicle were in, it was very likely something happened to her when she was driving through those dangerous parts of town just the night before. After meeting with Shirley, authorities finally went to collect the burned truck in hopes of getting some sort of evidence off of this vehicle. They had no idea what direction to go in. A full forensic examination was done on the vehicle, but it was burned. (laughs) So there was not really much they could take. And it's 1980. Exactly. So there's, you know, not much they can do in general, just with different forensic um, practices. But after being burned, forget it. So authorities decided to spread out around the community and they went door to door, hoping that they would find someone who had witnessed the abduction um, or maybe seen the car who ran away from the vehicle. They just needed more information, but unfortunately they came back empty handed. The following day, they decided to head out to Lopez Canyon, which is near the San Gabriel mountains on horseback and with dogs to see if maybe Melanie's body had been dumped because the location that this occurred at both where the car was seen being taken by the two men and where the car was burned. I think it was all within about 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes from Lopez Canyon. Um, and it was just the largest, closest area where you could dump a body and probably nobody would find it. Yeah. Meanwhile, while they're conducting all of these searches, authorities decided to ask the media to help get information out about Melanie to reach those that they could not reach through door-to-door questioning. And this ended up catching the attention of a 32-year-old woman named Etta Smith. So Etta worked at, in Burbank, California, so she was not too far, I think about 10 minutes away from where the searches and the abduction occurred. It was around 3 p.m. She had the radio on. She worked at an aerospace plant as a shipping clerk. And over the radio, it ended up being announced that a black truck had been found in flames on a residential road and that it was possibly connected to this missing woman, Melanie Uribe. And authorities were searching door to door for answers. Etta claimed that as soon as she heard this come on over the radio, she heard something that shocked her. She heard a voice say, she's not in the house. There was Mm -hmm. nobody around her to say this. It didn't come from the radio. She heard it as if it was someone saying it directly in front of her. As soon as she heard this phrase, she's not in a house, it felt like she was watching a movie. That's what she described it. And there's apparently, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I actually heard it in the Magellan episode, um, one of the first ones. Mm -hmm. There's a specific term for psychics that can see things like a movie, If any of you guys know it, let me know because it's totally blanking, but apparently it's a very rare thing. Yeah. (laughs) But the vision started to pop into her head and she was seeing Lopez Canyon. It was the same thing over and over going up a canyon road as if she was driving 
taking a sharp turn. And then she would see in her vision, it would focus very quickly on a dirt trail that led off of the main road. The vision would take Etta through this trail. And at the very end of the trail, there was a big hill in the background and then Melanie's body. And she remembered feeling like she couldn't understand if this woman needed help. Um, Maybe this woman was still alive or if it was already too late, but the vision just felt very overwhelming for her. She said that she attempted to continue on with her work, but the second she would let her mind drift, it immediately would end up right back on that video screen where she was constantly seeing Lopez Canyon and Melanie's body. Etta was hysterical at this point because Apparently, as a very young child, she remembered that she would know about things before they would happen, just very small instances. Mm -hmm. Um, And then on top of that, she would have this random knowledge of things, of things that she probably shouldn't have known about, um, nothing she'd ever been involved in. She would tell her mom every single time this would happen, even as a young child. And her mom would be like, you know, you don't don't tell anybody that you could get in trouble. People could think you're crazy. Um, Don't tell anyone when these things happen to you. So she really kept it to herself most of her life. But despite having all of these strange premonitions growing up, she had never in her life experienced anything like she was experiencing in that moment. She had never had any premonitions about a criminal case that was going on. It was just really small, random things. So Etta obviously said after this, she struggled for a bit on whether or not she should go to authorities, which I mean, if I all of a sudden started seeing things, right? <laughs> I'd probably, I'd probably struggle with that too. Yeah. Um, and on top of that, her mother had told her her entire life, you know, don't speak to people about these things. Um, but she felt like she had to say something. She knew that she was going to sound crazy if she went and reported this, but she also knew that she could not go to sleep at night knowing that she could potentially have information and just not report it. It was one of those situations where this could be absolutely nothing, but what if it's not? So Etta decided to risk looking absolutely insane and go straight to the police station to speak with a detective. When she arrived, she spoke with a detective named Lee Ryan about what she'd been seeing. She was actually able to directly pinpoint on a map where she believed based on the visions Melanie's body was. And authorities said, you know, we'll check into that and simply dismissed her. But Etta could not shake the visions she was continuing to have. They just kept on coming and kept getting more intense. And by the time she got home, her entire family noticed something is wrong. She is not herself. She decided, she decided to speak to them about it. Um, I think she had an eight-year-old daughter and a nine-year-old son. And I believe her cousin was there with her family at the time. And she was just telling them, you know, she just saw these visions. She went to the police department about it. And she said that she couldn't sit back any longer because she didn't know if they were actually going to go check. So she wanted to go check the area for herself. Mm, Interesting. Mm -hmm. Etta hopped in her car along with her two children and her cousin and headed out to Lopez Canyon. Meanwhile, Lee Ryan, who had spoken with Etta about her vision, he decided to get in contact with Patrick Conmay, who originally spoke to Melanie's friend the day prior. And he told him this story of this woman coming in, claiming to know all these things. And they weren't really sure what to think about this psychic vision, um, if they should believe it or, you know, check into it, or maybe she's just making things up. Is she possibly involved? And they had no idea the call that they were going to receive within 30 minutes. Etta drove up to the canyon and told her children, you guys need to look out on either side, look for any sign of a struggle, look for signs of this woman, um, and look for signs of things that I saw in my vision. And she, meanwhile, was driving and looking for the same things herself. And once they made it to the very top of the canyon, Etta was devastated because nothing she saw was ringing any bells, but she was still having this very overwhelming feeling of, at this point, it had changed from visions to being close to Melanie. She felt like she's got to be here. I can feel her here. So she didn't want to give up. They continued up and down the canyon road in search of Melanie. And then all of a sudden, something caught at his eye. There was an area on the road where it widened and it was one of the only places along the canyon road where you could pull over if you needed to. Mm -hmm. There was tire tracks on both sides of the road as if someone pulled over, turned around and then left again. So she pulled over to the side of the road, walked over to these tracks and laid her hand down on them and said that she immediately felt an overwhelming sense of fear and pain. She didn't see anything more. She didn't hear anything. She just felt Um, what she believed is what Melanie felt. They decided to continue further down the road. They didn't make it very far. And then Etta's daughter also saw something. 
Out of the corner of her eye, she saw what she thought was some clothing. So they decided to pull over. They got out of the car and just like that, Etta noticed a trail, exactly like the trail that she had seen and her vision. And her son even describes it in one documentary. He said it was the strangest feeling he'd ever felt because it didn't feel like a normal trail. He said it reminded him of like when you're walking down the aisle of a church with pews on the side because the trees were just so perfectly like up and wrapping around. Yeah. And when they got to the other side of this small trail, there was a body. Now, since Etta had never seen Melanie before, didn't know her, she wasn't sure if this was the missing mom, but she quickly looked over the body and noticed the nursing shoes. And this had been released on the radio show. So she knew pretty much exactly who she had found. They all, in a panic, raced back to the car to drive down the canyon, and they were headed straight to the police station. But the police got to them first. (laughs) They had actually sent an officer out to this location after what Etta had told them, and he was making his way up the canyon as they were coming down. Uh Uh-oh. They told him, you know, she said, I couldn't wait. I had to check to see. I couldn't shake this feeling, and we found her body. So they ended up taking him to her, and then... Patrick Conmay, the investigator, decided to go out to the scene and said, Etta needs to be brought in to be questioned. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean. Yeah. yeah. I mean, after all, she found the body after just earlier saying she knew where the (laughs) where the body was. Right. Um, So while that's all happening, Melanie's body was taken to a corner and they concluded that she had been murdered with the rock, a rock the size of probably a volleyball. So it was very violent. Um, meanwhile, Etta was being questioned for hours and police were not at all believing that she found Melanie's body through some vision. They were accusing her of committing this crime herself because, I mean, how else would some random person find a body within an hour of speaking to authorities about finding the body? Authorities had been searching for two days. They had been on horseback in the same, not the same exact area, but through Lopez Canyon, which is decently large from what I saw on Google Maps. Um, And they even brought dogs and they had found no sign of Melanie. The detection, the detectives questioning her became so irritated with her because she kept sticking to her story that they started throwing chairs and they were screaming at her. They were very frustrated and angry and she tried really hard to convince them, but it just wasn't working. So she's like, you know what? Forget it. I'll take a polygraph. And she thinks at this point, you know, I'll pass this with flying colors because I had these visions and they're thinking, oh, she's not going to pass this. And cliffhanger. She failed it. (laughs) What? She failed it. Wow. So they decided to bring in her children. They, this was terrible in my personal opinion, but they sweetened the kids up. They gave them lollipops and were really sweet to them. Asked them what happened that day, how they discovered the body. But according to her son, once those answers that they were giving didn't reflect the fact that their mother was responsible, authorities also took a turn on them. They started to scream at these kids and bang their fists on the table, scared them. They're eight and nine years old. They're horrified. Yeah. And once they finished questioning everyone, authorities said, you know, these stories aren't matching up. All these people, you know, it's changing from, you know, when exactly they found the body, who saw the body first, who saw things out the window. So, Etta was arrested for the murder of Melanie Uribe. And she was taken to jail. She was immediately strip searched. She was immediately cavity searched. Absolutely traumatized. She just had chairs thrown at her. (laughs) And she felt horrible because she said, you know, I did the right thing. I tried really hard to help. She's like, I didn't, don't gain anything off of this. I never would have coming into authorities. She had no idea that she was going to end up being held responsible for the murder of this young woman. Now, Patrick Conmay, the lead investigator again, he came in the following day and he had no idea investigators had questioned Etta and her children. He had no idea that she had been arrested. Mm -hmm. He had told them, you know, obviously bring her in and question her, but he said that and was hoping he would get a little bit more information because he wanted to speak with her the next day. He didn't believe that she was responsible. He said there was never a moment in time where he thought she in any way, shape or form was connected to the crime. And he was angry yeah he attempted to have her released but there was obviously not many ways to do that other than finding out who was actually responsible so he felt horrible because he was the one who said bring her in for questioning and he dove straight into finding out who actually murdered melanie uribe within 24 hours a woman called claiming she knew who killed melanie and that she also had the murder weapon a rock 
Now, this was huge because authorities said that this information had not yet been released publicly, so they wanted to meet with this woman immediately. But before they could get any more information out of her, she said she was scared of who was responsible, and without naming herself, she hung up the phone. <clears throat> Typical, right? Yeah, yeah. Another day later, a man called and then met with authorities, giving them the names of some individuals that spoke to someone who claimed to be responsible for Melanie's murder. This led them to 17-year-old Norman Willis. Norman ended up refusing to speak to the police, but his parents said, absolutely not. And we're giving you the name of one of his friends that we do not like. <laughs> this man is 20-year-old Lewis Morgan, um, and he had a bit of a record. Norman's parents said they fully believed that if their son was involved in any of this, it had to do with this man, Lewis Morgan. So authorities were able to find out, again, he had a criminal record, but he also had an outstanding warrant. So they were able to bring him in and question him about Melanie's murder. And he immediately pretty much confessed to being involved. He stated that Norman Willis um, was also involved as well, but there was also a third person that had yet to be named, 21-year-old Spencer Nelson. Lewis told authorities that they had been hanging out that night and randomly decided, hey, you know what? Let's rob somebody. And just at that moment, Melanie pulled up to the spotlight. Oh, wow. Stoplight, not spotlight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... Lewis stated that they drove her up the canyon and walked her down the trail to dump her while still alive. They took everything that they could from her. Um, she did end up being sexually assaulted, and then they were just going to dump her. But as they were leaving, Spencer Nelson said that they needed to kill her to keep her quiet. He apparently had previously spent time in jail and had just been released for another robbery and sexual assault. And he left that young woman alive, and she turned him in and was able to identify him. And he did not want this to happen again. No one else agreed. They were like, absolutely not. At the very most, we'll tie her up in a way that she can, you know, eventually get out, but we're not killing her. He agreed to this and they all decided to walk back to search the car for anything that they could use to tie her up. But he snuck away, mm. sneakily, <laughs> very sneakily, and ended up killing Melanie with a rock. <sighs> Terrible. He then decided to take the rock with him and they set the car on fire, left the rock in a gutter by Lewis Morgan's girlfriend's house. And this man took them straight to where the rock was left, but it was gone. But Patrick Conway was like, you know what? Two and two together, I bet you money. It was the girlfriend that called about this rock. Right. So he ended up going to her house and confronting her. And she admitted it and said she would go get the rock where she hid it and she would be right back. And she, sure enough, I think after about 20 minutes, came back with a... Um, a little bag with a rock in it. They had their murder weapon. The three men ended up being charged and convicted with first degree murder, accessory to murder, sexual assault, and kidnapping, and they were all sentenced to life in prison. But then that leaves Etta. Mm -hmm. Etta had not been responsible for the murder of Melanie. Her visions had to have been real. I mean, after all, she was able to take herself directly within 30 minutes of, I think, leaving the no, leaving her home. She found the body. Right. So on December 21st, after a few days of being in jail, after ending up with dysentery, after being absolutely humiliated, stripped down, a bunch of terrible things, she was released. But authorities never said a thing to her. They didn't apologize to her for wrongfully arresting her. They didn't talk to her again about how on earth she managed to know where Melanie's body was. So a year later, she ended up suing them because authorities had arrested her on probable cause because of a psychic vision. And her attorney said, that's absolute crap. They had no real evidence um, after only a few hours of questioning her. And she ended up being successful in her lawsuit. So while many people still speculate if she really did have these visions or if maybe she just got lucky while playing detective, right. authorities have stated that this actually changed them into believers. Patrick Conway, he says he fully believes it at this point. Hmm. She had absolutely no connection with Melanie whatsoever when they looked deeper into it. Um, and the information she gave authorities immediately after leaving work couldn't be explained any other way. Yeah. And a huge thank you to the episode Suddenly Psychics, jamesblatt.com, and people.com for articles in regards to this ridiculous case. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, what you do know, you think, John? I'm so, I've been sitting here waiting to hear. I've been, I've been analyzing all of <laughs> your, face, your facial movements. There's, um, well, the first thing <laughs> is I don't knock the police for making a run at her 
because oh, absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you have someone that f- finds a body and you're going up there to check and she's just coming down the hill. And it's like, oh, wait, you know, I'm worried in that situation that if she did have something to do with it or somehow knew one of these young men that were related to it, mm-hmm. that she was trying to find an excuse for going up there to like get rid of some evidence or yep. adjust something to make it look different. Um, so I don't really. And, and did she only come down? Like, would she have actually gone to the police department or did she only say something because a police happened to catch her there? <laughs> well, but that's what I'm thinking of. Like, if if you were trying to set up a yeah. situation where you can do that and not get in trouble for being found up there. Oh, that's what you're saying. Okay, I'm following now. Yeah. I wasn't for a minute. I haven't so had enough go, caffeine today. <laughs> right. So go to the police station first yeah. and say, oh, I've had this vision and I think I know where she is. And then from there. I jam right to wherever I was going, make whatever changes I'm needing to make, and then try to get out of there. Um, I don't I know. Even thought about it that way. Yeah, I don't know that that's really what's going on here. I'm just, I'm just trying to look yeah. at it from the police's perspective. The other thing is, she's not a psychic. Like she doesn't have a storefront. She doesn't do yeah. readings for people. She has no previous experience, at least that we know of, to support. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, we, we know the backstory now about her being a child and, and yeah. having some answers come to her. Um, th- there is something that's really unique about this case in that I do believe that people can get – I don't know if visions is the right term, but yeah. I think we've all had those moments where it's like – I know exactly who's calling me right now. And you pick up the phone. And I mean, this is before cell phones. Yeah. This, this used to happen sometimes where like I would say, oh, my God, my friend's about to call and the phone would ring and I go pick it up and mm-hmm. it's your friend. And there's just things you just can't explain that yeah, sometimes. Exactly. So that's kind of where I'm at with this story. I'm wondering if this is and I think she even claims that that this she's not a psychic necessarily she's someone that had a very unusual experience happen to Mm -hmm. her and i think she's had like i think she was on that one show that i spoke about um suddenly psychic but after that i think she's even had people like approach her about things and she i think she said like she has people that are like oh could you give me information on this like as a joke and she won't do it yeah and she said she'd never experienced anything like that before. And, yeah. But that is what I found very interesting is the fact that, you know, you look into a lot of these cases and it seems like v- you see a very clear motive in it almost. A lot of these people want to charge people or they want to, you know, they want fame from it. They want people to be very interested in them. And since they're psychic, it's like they don't ever have to actually prove anything <laughs> right. because, you know, they get to be general and say all these things. But... Um, that's what I think caught my attention with this case in particular. And this is actually a very well-known case. Yeah. Um, probably the most well-known that a lot of people question because they're like, this woman literally just, I mean, she was at work. They knew she was at work. And then all of a sudden she just had this crazy vision. But what also is interesting about it, there's, there's two other points for me. One of them Mm -hmm. is when she does go looking, the methods that you're hearing, at least in how you've told us the story are regular investigation methods. She has her her kids, they're driving around, her kids are looking for things, she's looking for things. So at some point, you have to wonder, okay, what prompted them to go to this area in particular? Um, Did she, was she familiar with this area before? How did she even give the map to the police? There's a lot of questions that kind of spin off of, of that. And the other thing is, if you told this same exact story and removed her, and remove the discovery of the body, this case gets solved. Exactly. So it really, I mean, yes, you know, it's, it's, it certainly gives me warm fuzzies to think about uh, someone's body being found and taken mm-hmm. out of the wilderness and a, a proper burial and all those good things. But effectively, does it really, did it really solve the case? Does it really impact the case in a significant way? I don't know. I don't know either, because if you think about it, as well, there were there were people that were talking. These people that did commit the crime, they were telling people about it. Right. So, whereas I could maybe understand how this was very, very helpful because in situations like that, especially, bodies are going to deteriorate very fast yeah. and a lot of evidence could be gone. Yeah. They already took the murder weapon with them, which the girlfriend apparently went and hid, which is like a whole other story. Right. Um, but... Because they, the people were already talking within two days, I absolutely think this would have been solved regardless. Yeah. But I found it, I, but I did, I did find it so fascinating though. But when, when you were speaking about the fact that it was very regular investigative skills that were being used, 
that was the one thing that really hung me up on this because I don't know, I tiptoe on the borderline of thinking, you know, I believe in some of this stuff. I really do. I'm a crazy nut. I'm surrounded by crystals and sage all the time and my plants. I talk to them. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, one thing that did get to me is even authorities right off the bat were like, okay, so let's think about it this way. She's caught here on this road in her car. They get in. Her her car is found burned, I think, not even five minutes up the road. You take one right, you're in Lopez Canyon. Right. So, like, it would be kind of what I think even common sense would tell you. They're not going to dump this body anywhere around here because it's, you know, it's a very populated area. All they had to do was make one turn, drive up Lopez Canyon. And, I mean, yeah, it's to me, I do think it's kind of – a common sense thing. So if she heard it and was just particularly invested in helping to find this woman, yeah. you know, I could see how it could be one of those things. Cause I mean, this whole community that road, we're in yeah. is people that are trying to help in those ways. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It's so difficult. <laughs> well, um, keep it in mind, especially the investigation techniques, because that's going to come up again once we get to my story. But right now, we've got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I've been using HelloFresh for months, and cooking at home has never been so easy, fun, and delicious. HelloFresh delivers a box right to my door with step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients, everything that I need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. I have made the best dishes of my life, and I'm not exaggerating, using HelloFresh. Just ask my wife. Seriously, thank you, HelloFresh. It's been amazing. <laughs> we have had salsa verde enchiladas, you guys. They're absolutely amazing. And it was also great knowing that they kept my allergies in mind and completely out of my meals. They want to help make your life easier. Easily change your delivery days, food preferences, and even skip a week if you need to. You can also add extra meals, lunches, tasty sides. There's all kinds of stuff you can add to your order. Plus, HelloFresh is now from $5.66 per serving. Also right now, instead of just skipping, you can also choose to donate your food to someone in need, which I thought was absolutely awesome. I do too. HelloFresh has a great offer for our listeners. Go to hellofresh.com forward slash crime after crime 10 and use code crime after crime 10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. You heard that right. Go to hellofresh.com forward slash crime after crime 10 right now and use code crime after crime 10 and you will get 10 free meals, including free shipping free food, sign me up. Try HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit today. Are you still paying inflated prices and hidden fees to one of those big guys when you could be paying just 15 bucks a month with Mint Mobile? Knock it off. With Mint Mobile, you get great network coverage at literally a fraction of the cost. The activation process is easy with just a few minutes of your time. You can save literally hundreds of dollars a year. I tried two phones side by side, one on my old service and the other on Mint Mobile. Connection strength, sound quality, even internet speeds were identical. They keep their costs down by handling everything online and then pass the savings on to you. The future of wireless cell phone service is finally here. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. Don't pay for unlimited data that you're not using. Find the perfect size data plan. Choose between three, eight, or 12 gigabytes of 4G LTE data. The average American only uses four to five gigs monthly. You can also bring your old phone number over to Mint Mobile. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. That's mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. Ditch that old wireless bill and start saving with Mint Mobile. Looking for another amazing true crime podcast? From the Los Angeles Times comes It Was Simple, The Betty Broderick Murders. Hosted by award-winning writer and reporter Pat Morrison, Betty Broderick thought she had the perfect life and the perfect marriage. Until one day in 1989, it all came crashing down. The once traditional housewife murdered her ex-husband and his new wife. This is a case that grabbed the nation, spawned several books and even a TV movie. Now you can hear all the critical and controversial points drilled into one by one. Divorce, family, insanity, female powerlessness, and wealth, the good, bad, and very ugly sides of the American dream. 
Wait until you hear how she carried all this out and the haunting last words of her husband. Veteran reporter Pat Morrison will give you all those details and much more, including why after 30 years, five bullets, two coffins, and one California inmate, we just can't look away from Betty Broderick. Every binge-worthy episode of It Was Simple, The Betty Broderick Murders is available now. So check it out today wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Welcome back, everyone, and please support these amazing companies that believe in crime after crime. And now, I'm here. I feel, I'm telling you, I feel like me and you are both on such a different spectrum here. I feel like I'm way more... Is that what your psychic pulse, your psychic incense is is telling you? It is. It's (laughs) telling... Hold on, let me just tune into it real quick. (laughs) I do. I feel like you are such a skeptic, whereas I kind of, I kind of am like, eh, I'll listen to it. Like Dan- the, but Danielle, I, I, just, I do, I do like ghost sighting stories and UFO stuff on my channel. I, but it's, it's strange because when I got started, um, I was always open to those kind of stories and mm-hmm. the more I drill into them, it sometimes breaks my heart when it comes yeah. down to just, oh, this person said that happened and there's no physical evidence. There's no one else that witnessed whatever happened. Um, you're waiting. You're waiting for that one thing that you're like, yes, I knew it. <laughs> I'm not just waiting. I'm literally asking. Like I, I've told my audience several times over the years, hey, if you guys find, even with psychics, if you find a particular story where a psychic helps solve the case, please let me know about it. Do you know how great that video would be for me to say, hey, we've proved it. It's like, happened. <laughs> yeah, I've got it. It's here. There's no doubt. We have footage. We have testimony. We have independent sources. So admittedly. I do think I set my bar kind of high. I get that. I completely do. With all that in mind, I'm going to do my best. I'm not going to be cynical. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I'm not going to be cynical. This isn't a look of doubt at all on my face. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, Danielle. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for your confidence in me. Um, All right. So, look, my main mission with today's episode was to find a case solved by Psychic that I could verify with several reliable sources. As usual, I was trying to really keep an open mind when looking into these stories, but after speaking to so many people with missing loved ones that told me how much they were targeted and Mm -hmm. emotionally hurt by psychics, it's been tough. Recently, like literally just a week ago, uh, I've spoken to a mother with a missing daughter, and she swears that a YouTube psychic is, is actually helping her. But when I asked her for information, we wound up just talking about known facts about the case. And then I kind of pulled it back and asked again, I'm like, but what are you hearing specifically from the psychic that you didn't know before? And she replied that it wasn't really facts. It was speculation on emotions and some extremely vague geographical details. Yeah. Same as I've heard before from families that don't put much stock into psychic abilities. I'll never forget. One family in particular that lives in Florida with their missing daughter and a psychic told them that she'd be found by palm trees. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, boy. (laughs) um, But I'm I'm still I'm trying to be open to all this. And I want to admit that if there's an emotional component that's truly helping these grieving families, I'm all for that. But for today's challenge, that's not going to be enough. Yep. If this is legit. There has to be a big case out there solved by Psychic, one that's been written about in publications bigger than PsychicBloggers.com, one that all the other Psychics point to when asked, hey, tell me about a big case that was solved by a Psychic. I feel like we've all had moments of amazing intuition that seem unbelievable, but I'm looking for someone that can do that regularly. I'm also trying to find something from this century. So I changed my approach. I started looking for a psychic, someone who's claiming to have solved a case and at least has an independent source like a reporter actually supporting their story. Maybe someone that's been featured on several national television shows, newspapers, and even recently started their own podcast. Mm. Buckle up, Danielle. Oh boy, I'm so interested to hear this. In 2016... Andrea Pizer wrote an article for the New York Post titled, Meet the Psychic, Who Uses Gift to Solve FBI Cold Cases. 
and I thought I would win this month. I just read off the article you title. Sure Are you kidding it. me? Yeah. Done. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. This article introduced me to Troy Griffin. According to his website, psychicmediumtroy.com, Troy is a, you guessed it, psychic medium, but he's also a life coach. And he's been featured on ABC News Nightline, Fox News, ID, which his website thinks stands for Investigations Discover, uh, the CW San Diego. Uh, he's also been on People Magazine, Vice, the Kansas Wichita Eagle, the Denver Post, Westward, and several local radio stations. His site claims he's a psychic investigator with consultation on more than 600 missing person and cold cases. And his work has taken him throughout the United States, Canada, the UK, Germany, and Australia. Interestingly, on an interview with ABC News in 2017, he states it was actually 100 cases worked over six years. And when asked this specific question, quote, do you know what the percentage rate is in terms of? He replies, on the cases I work, 18 to 20 percent. So I wish I knew the rest of her question. I think that mm -hmm. was, I don't think it was even clever editing. I think they were trying to cut it off for some reason. Oh, on purpose. Yeah. I'm assuming that she was asking about success rate. Yeah. That's what I would assume as well. The interviewer then replies to him, well, some people would say that's kind of low. And Troy responded, when you look at murder cases and unsolved missing persons, there are very few percentage that actually get solved. So, Danielle, I have to ask you here. Um, for me, you know, I do updates regularly on missing persons mm -hmm. cases that I've covered. And if I took credit for those cases, uh, I would say I'm probably around 20% of those cases also being solved. Yeah. Doesn't that sound that. about right of the stuff that, that we cover? Yeah, it's like 15 to 20, you're going to have some significant update, person being found yeah. or charges or something like that. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Um, Troy says that he's also known about his intuitive ability since the age of 12. But in his mid 40s, he had a vision of his friend, Diana, getting into a car accident and he told her about it. Well, that totally saved her, right? Nope. I don't know. And I don't know if I want to be told that. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that a great friend? I would never get in the car ever yeah. again. Are they, is he just trying to tell her that he thinks that she's a bad driver? Um, Maybe. Well, she wasn't safe. The accident still happened. But thankfully, there were no serious injuries. And who knows? Maybe his warning caused her to act differently or made her more aware. And, you know, she remembered to buckle her safety belt or something. We'll, we'll likely never know. But it is worth noting that auto insurance experts say that the average driver will be in about four car accidents in their lifetime. I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Chances of car accidents are pretty high. Yeah. And if, if you plan on living at least another 20 years, I can reasonably say that I'm concerned that every person listening to this podcast right now will be in a car accident. Yeah. And I'll even take it one further and say you might experience that when you're on the way to or from your home. Am I ready to be a psychic, Danielle? I think you might be. I think so. When this happens to someone, I'm immediately being like, John, he said it. Yep. He did it. John, help. <laughs> I'm going to start. I'm going to call you and be like, you, you, you knew. Listeners, I want you to tweet me. I want you to tweet me when it happens. <laughs> and let me apologize in advance for being right. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the New York Post article continues to mainly detail two cases. And thankfully, they've both at least happened in this century. One of a missing mother of three from Georgia named Ashley Jones. Police suspected a drug overdose and had some good reason to think that she was on drugs. She walked off without shoes through broken glass. Mm -hmm. Her body was found a month later by a hiker and toxicology tests were inconclusive. Psychic Troy Griffin was in contact with the missing woman's mother and told her that he didn't believe it. He suspected our, partic our particular man. To quote the article, a man who Griffin suspected was involved in her death was arrested and charged in an unrelated kidnapping. The case of Ashley Jones remains open. So we have no name for the man, no name for the victim of the unrelated okay. kidnapping and no impact to the case whatsoever. And that case happened four years ago. Seems like this story was hardly verified by the reporter, or if it was, she didn't want to release enough details for it to be independently checked. 
possibly she didn't want to risk some sort of libel suit by naming a guy and saying he's related to a case that he might not have anything to do with. I don't know why they didn't include those details. Yeah. That whole that whole thing, I, I would have read that and been like, yeah, okay. I know. <laughs> and, mo- and moved on from it entirely. Yeah, yeah. But remember what the title of this article was, Danielle. This is my winning article. Yes, it is. Yeah. I believe it. I've got faith. <laughs> <laughs> well, so far, hardly a win for my new approach. But luckily, there was another case mentioned, and thankfully, it had more detail. The disappearance of Laura Costner, a 42-year-old mother of two who went missing from Tennessee. Laura went out to pick up her son from school. Then the school got a text message from her saying that she would be late due to a flat tire, but she never showed up. Her sister-in-law contacted Troy for help. This is a quote from the New York Post article. Looking at the area in which Costner disappeared, on Google Maps, I see pictures, places, and things. I saw the road where she vanished. I'm really trying not to be cynical, (laughs) but Troy, I also see pictures, places, and things when I look at Google Maps. (laughs) No, that's hilarious. Yeah. (laughs) I'm I'm just not sure that that's how this whole clairvoyant thing is supposed to work. Yeah, I don't think so either. I don't know. Uh, Troy then went to Facebook and found three people, two men and a woman on the missing woman's list of friends and sent their names and pictures to her sister-in-law. The sister-in-law sent that info to the police, and a few hours later, they found the body, according to Troy. It would turn out that a 19-year-old robbed and killed Laura. Troy says the 19-year-old was his, quote, main person of interest. Any clarification on the 19-year-old being one of the Facebook photos? Nope. Can I verify that Troy's input had anything to do with Laura being found? Nope. As a matter of fact, this New York Post article seems to be the only article even connecting Troy to Laura's case. Did the police use the psychic tip and just keep it under wraps so they could get credit for solving the case? Nope. Can I tell you how Laura's body was actually found? Yes. Oh my goodness. This yeah. went downhill so very quickly. I, I was trying so hard. This was, is the best of what I've found. I mean, but the sad thing is, it is kind of like the, the title of the article is the best thing that I've heard so far. It I never know. really started off on a high note at all. Just kind of was questionable information. And then it just got even worse. <laughs> I know it. I know it. And I know you're familiar with him too. We'll talk about that after. I am. Yeah. Um, Laura's body was found either near or actually on property belonging to the family of McKinley Cody, the 19-year-old responsible for her murder. The person that found and called in the body, according to the sheriff, was Jerry Cody, who is McKinley's grandfather. So it probably didn't take Sherlock Holmes to solve this case. Yeah, no. It's on the family's property, found by grandpa. At the same time this was going down, McKinley Cody and his mother had other charges pending on a case where they were reportedly trying to smuggle drugs into a local jail. Investigators think that Laura may have been selling some of her prescription meds to McKinley. Oh, man. Yeah. McKinley Cody pleaded guilty and wound up with a sentence of 30 years in jail. When interviewed on Investigations (laughs) Discover... (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm formally going to change the name to to that i'm never referring to it as anything else ever again <laughs> troy told an interviewer that when he does what he does is see the crime by connecting through the victim's eyes to which the interviewer blurted out you do have really good eye contact <laughs> oh good grief <laughs> I don't think that that was what he was talking about, but... I don't think so either. Yeah. He then continued to detail that he goes to the last known location on Google Maps and he lets the maps guide him. He also tells a bit of a different story about how he got his start in this interview. He's saying that someone asked him if he was a psychic, like he was at a store somewhere. Someone asked him if he was a psychic and he just said yes. And it was surprising him that these words were coming out of his mouth. They asked him about a missing persons case, and he gave them all sorts of detail, including the body's location. Um, But in his retelling of that story, once again, we don't get any names, no details, nothing that I could use to verify those claims. He then goes into a few other cases while he's being 
interviewed by investigations discover <laughs> um he does go into names and details on those one of them is the case that you know about um yeah. but, but they're currently unsolved and he just honestly to me sounds like any other true crime youtuber or podcaster he ref he refers to research that he does using his google maps ouija board and even mentions gray <laughs> <laughs> Is this Gray Hughes? Is this Gray Hughes? <laughs> I need to tell Gray. Yeah, he needs a crystal ball and we're going to start. He does. He yeah, does. We're going to start a new business. Um, <laughs> yeah, Troy even mentions running background checks on people that he's suspicious of. So in that interview from ID that's on his version that's linked from his website on YouTube, there are two comments and they're literally a copy of the same comment that's in there twice. Quote, psychics are real. A lot of them aren't. <laughs> <laughs> and the comments were made by Peter Pan. <laughs> and I'm not joking. This is all true. And here's a screenshot for our YouTube audience of Peter Pan making the comment. There are so many different phrases from this entire episode that I'm using for the rest of my life. And just to bring myself back to this moment of absolute absurdity. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I think I'm failing at the cynical thing. I'm really, I'm not even we, trying anymore. <laughs> look, I started it. I was the first one to crack a laugh. I was. But, but this is like past the line of just being... Mm, okay. And this, and I mean, this guy gets press, he gets press all over the place. That's why I was looking. I was like, I want to find someone where there's sources talking about them. We can check this stuff. Um, and he is being talked about, but it's. But it's upsetting because there's, he's being spoken about, but not a single person can really seem to say a name or back up anything he's saying. It's just yeah. all taking his word for it, which no wonder he's getting press because once one person starts doing that, everyone's just immediately is going to blindly follow. And then. Yeah. Well, we, we're going to get to the good part now. Um, despite comments that I'm seeing that he did say he worked for free on many cases, the contact form on his website plainly states, do not respond, uh, does not respond to inquiries looking for free answers. But if you want his help, you can pay $98 for a 30 minute session, $125 for a case review. And it's clear that that's only a review, not a full investigation. You know, he's not going to just break out his Google Maps Ouija board and do background checks on people for 125 bucks. Oh, no, it's much more than that. Yeah. Uh, according to ABC News, his full investigations will cost you up to 250 bucks an hour. He's charging like PI rates, basically. John, that's so bad. Yeah. Uh, or wait, but there's a good deal you can get, Danielle. For $225, okay, <laughs> you can pay for Troy to play bingo with a psychic with you and four of your friends. Bingo winners get a question answered and someone will win a free reading. I should probably hire this guy for yellow tape true crime game time for the next I was, episode. <laughs> I was just about to say, I know who needs to be on, on true crime game time. <laughs> Absolutely. He I plays bingo. Yeah, great. I really did think, Danielle. I'm Charge like, him $225. $225. Like if you want to be on here, it'll get you exposure, but you're at least going to have to give us $225. I, yeah, I don't think he's going to want to talk to me, especially if he ever gets wind of this podcast. I did think about, should I try like doing a consult? Like, you know, calling him know. up and seeing how it goes, but I didn't. Don't send me because I'm a dingus. And then I will just, he'll say one thing that's way too vague. And because I just like have so much hope in the world, I'll be like, oh, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do that, so you you do that. Leave me out of that part of it. <laughs> no, I don't. And, and I'm telling you, I still don't write it off. I think the trouble I have is thinking that people have tuned themselves to the point of being able to, used as a to, to be used as a tool. I don't oh, yeah. think I've seen that. What, I get that completely. I, I think there is strange connectivity. I think people do get strange impulses and messages that we can't explain. But yeah. this particular thing, and look, I mean, it's just all over his website. It's just, this is money, money, money. Yeah. Um, but he has also recently started the True Crime Psychic podcast. Now, Danielle, I know you'll okay. love this. Oh, boy. There's only four episodes that have been released so far, and two of them have been about the Tiger King. <laughs> if this doesn't scream, though, like someone jumping on to the biggest stories to like get the most attention right. as much as possible. Yep. 
Oh, man. And he does, it's almost like he doesn't even try to make it seem. I mean, it's very obvious. Yeah. Yeah. So is Troy an exceptional psychic or just an average web sleuth on ABC News in an interview that he doesn't actually feature on his website? It's stated, quote, of the roughly 100 cases Troy says he has worked on, he could not provide one example to ABC News to verify his contribution on a police investigation. Oh, man. Yeah. Now, what about that article title from the New York Post? Meet the psychic who uses GIF to solve FBI cold cases. Well, first of all, mm, I don't think either of those cases was necessarily a cold case. One of them isn't actually solved. The other was solved by a suspect's grandpa and neither that I could see had anything to do with the FBI. So the title, just plain BS. Uh, Danielle, my attempt to find a great instance of a psyching, uh, of a psyching, that's what I'm going to call him now, <laughs> a psychic solving a case may have failed miserably, but I hope our listeners appreciated watching me writhe in agony as Troy's news coverage failed me at every single turn. And unfortunately, this is the best of the cases that I looked into. Thank you to ABC News, the New, the New York Post. I'm going to thank you guys anyway. PsychicMediumTroy.com, WBIR, WCYB, Knoxville News, ID, Investigations Discover, and Medium.com for information contributing to today's story. I consulted no known skeptical sources, Danielle. And I know you, th- you thought I was already going skeptical on it. I didn't look up. Yeah. I didn't look up anything on skeptoid skeptic.com. I didn't even look up anything on Snopes about this. I was literally just trying to take this story and then verify it using my usual methods of looking into stories. And this is what I wound up with. I'm not thanking psychicbloggers.com, but I'm pretty sure they're already (laughs) aware of that. Probably. They've known about this for a while. (laughs) (laughs) That is so disappointing because I, the thing is, I've, I saw his name all over when I was doing my own research Yeah, and it just, I think what blows my mind the most is that it does genuinely seem like a lot of these different psychics are just, they've, they're just smart. They've got like common sense, great common sense. And instead of being like, I've, you know, I can come up with ideas very easily, right? you know, that might help. It's like they have to go some wild way with it to get like the most attention they possibly can, which is unfortunate because I'm right there with you. I feel like we do have these moments where things may happen that we can't explain. Yeah. For instance, me and my sister, without fail, every single time I go to text her, she texts me at the exact same time. Right, right. It's just like small stuff like that. You know, I think there are these weird phenomenons that happen, but... That was super disappointing, especially for someone who seems to really be throwing themselves out there and charging people and making all these extravagant claims for it to not be backed up at all. It's shocking that all this information, all these interviews have even been done with him to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, to your point about the being charged thing, I occasionally have people reach out to me that are like, can I get you to cover this case and how much would it cost or how much can I pay you to do this? And it never, I've never entertained it. It has never occurred to me to try to charge people in that direction. I've had people I've, I've told about my um, website that I've put together for missing Mm -hmm. persons tips and they're like, well, why don't you write that in a book? And then you can sell the book. I'm like, cause I don't want it to be sold. I want people to be able to get this information for free because they need the help. Exactly. So to think of someone, you know, First of all, if I had a talent like that, I'm not going to waste any time being a life coach. I'd be working every single case that I could, helping as many people as possible. I was going to ask about that whole life coach thing. It's, yeah, it's just weird. I mean, I mean, come on, man. You can solve cases. You can help find missing persons. And you're going to spin off a life coach business. What kind of sense does this make? Exactly. Um, it just makes me feel like it was just like a whole bunch of grasping at opportunity and like hanging on for dear life and then seeing where different opportunities would spiral him and where they could land him and how he could go from there. Right. Right. Which is really, really disappointing. <clears throat> yeah. And keep in mind, kind of sounds almost like a little bit of a midlife crisis. This guy didn't get into this line of business until he's in his 40s. That's when exactly. he supposedly had his big moment. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I guess I can't knock midlife crises. I became a YouTuber. But, uh, <laughs> <John>. <laughs> 
<laughs> Here I am doing crime <laughs> after my, crime. My midlife crisis turned out great. That's right. I can't <laughs> knock it. Um, we are running out of time, but we did want to share a couple of other stories with you. And I know you guys are probably thinking, well, John's completely biased at this point. And I just want to say, curse you, Troy Griffin, for shattering my beliefs. Exactly. Way to go, Troy. Yeah. Um, but let's jump into a couple here. Uh, there was a very popular thing that happened. Danielle, why don't you tell oh, us about uh, the good old Montel Williams show? Oh, boy. So on the Montel Williams show, and I feel like a lot of you guys are already knowing exactly where this is going. Yeah. Famed psychic Sylvia Brown told the mother of missing girl Amanda Berry that she felt that Amanda was no longer alive. Amanda's mother ended up dying, thinking that her daughter was dead. And then what happened several years later? Amanda Berry was able to escape the home of Ariel Castro and help the two other women held captive and they're with her out as well. Um, they all were freed. Every single one of them. Yeah. And her mom died thinking that she had died because of what Sylvia said. And Sylvia stated, I kid you not, I have been more right than wrong. When she was, ref <laughs> I'm telling you, I can't, I can't handle it. When she's referencing Amanda Berry's story. Um, Sylvia did pass away in 2013, but how, I've been more right than wrong. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's just another one of those phrases I'm going to start using all the time now. Well, <laughs> someone's like, you're not right about that. I'm like, well, technically, this is not a common occurrence. I'm usually more right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's a very goodness. valid defense there. And like, how could you? But that's another issue that I have is some of these people flat out say things as if they're 100% fact and they know it. Yeah. It well, destroys these families. And I know we both talked about it before recording, but in our research, we, there's a lot of lists that are out there that are like, here's no. the cases that are going to prove that psychics actually solve cases. Um, Bustle.com put a list together and here's a couple of their top choices. Uh, now, I just want to say that if you're already setting your beliefs and you don't see the skeptical side of things, I totally get it. Take these stories at face value and you'll be good. But don't do any further research on these because seriously, even both these stories I went looking into and I'm like, uh-oh, can't go there. No, the, little, the little paragraphs about them are great. And you'll be like, oh, wow, that's shocking. Yeah, <laughs> but so, then like the second you go to Google, it, it's like, wait. <laughs> yeah. So we want to give you some of those little paragraphs, some of the some of the good stories. Danielle, tell them about 1984. So one day in 1984, Arthur Herbert and his three passengers disappeared in the plane that he was piloting. The search turned up absolutely no clue. So it ended up being called off. Herbert's sister, Jessica, was not ready to quit. She enlisted the help of psychic detective Noreen, is it Rainier? Yeah. That's how I'm going to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who gave her the exact coordinates of the crash site, in addition to details of Herbert's final moments. Isn't that awesome? That's pretty <laughs> Don't look it up for yourselves. <laughs> it's, that's a crazy story. Just don't Google it. <laughs> that's right. And definitely don't pay any, t any attention to federal no. judges that comment about Noreen or her skills. Mm -mm. Don't do it. Uh, or visit her extra website. We won't go there either. Yeah. Uh, Penny Sarah was murdered on July 16th, 1973, and police were unsuccessful in finding her killer. They turned to a psychic named Pascarella Downey. Downey told them that they wouldn't find Sarah's murderer right away, but to look for a mechanic whose name started with an E. She predicted that they would connect him to the murder by blood. It took 26 years, but Edward Grant, that's an E, formerly a mechanic, was later arrested after a DNA blood test connected him to the death of Sarah. Grant was convicted and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison in 2002. So there. Oh. My goodness. Yeah. But it, once again, it's kind of one of these stories where there's a psychic and they're giving information <clears throat> yeah. and the information, I mean, 26 years to solve a case. Is it really helping? I don't know. I don't know. But that's the show that we have for you guys on Solved by Psychic. Oh, man. Who's going to win this month? Because I feel like we both... It was so different. We never do this. This feels like a totally weird episode because yeah. I feel like we both came from different perspectives and we also told like two very versions of very different versions of, you know, psychics helping. I don't know. I personally totally believe the woman that I spoke about. <laughs> yeah. I do. Yeah. I do. I genuinely do. I think that's crazy what you found. I definitely don't think it solved anything. And I definitely think there are other ways to explain it, but we'll see. 
I'm more apt to believe that one. Um, I mean, I mean, we've already gone into this, but I think the uh, impulse thing, I can't yeah. deny that. And if she you had can't. an impulse that brought her to that area, I don't think I can deny that. Nope. We'll see. So guys, who's going to win this month? You get to vote. Who had the best solved by psychic or John's not quite Solved by Psychic Story. Which one? <laughs> you guys pick. <laughs> That's right. You'll be able to vote at our Twitter account at Crime After Pod for seven days after the episode drops. Or you guys can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there since they have taken away the lovely voting feature this month. But you guys can still go to the link in the description box below to hit that um, link. And there's still going to be an I. It'll just link you to the, the website. website. Yeah. And that's where you can vote. Yeah. Uh, also at Crime After Crime Podcast, you can find all the links you'll ever need for our show, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon or shop our Teespring store where you can be a winner every month with your own Crime After Crime mug. And as always, thank you so much to our patrons. You guys get to enjoy a lovely Patreon special segment monthly. This past month was actually a whole lot of fun. It's one of my mm -hmm. favorite ones we've done in a while. Um, <laughs> and you also get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. That's right. So what's coming up for <laughs> our next episode, August 1st, 2020? Worst date ever. Now, what does that mean? We're looking for a date where a crime occurred. What do you think, this Danielle? This could go so many different ways. Yeah. So many different ways. So I'm interested. I'm interested to see. This show is produced and hosted by the amazing Danielle Hallen and the wonderful John Lorden. If you enjoyed the show, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help us is to tell others, tell your friends, tell your family that you love crime after crime and they need to check it out. We'll see you guys next time. Bye bye. Bye.